You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hey folks, thanks for joining me on this fine Wednesday. Um, I'm just really pumped to introduce today's guest. Uh, and today's guest is Ricky Zhang, the founder of Prince of Travel. Uh, Prince of Travel is a travel company that started off as a blog where Ricky started just writing about posts on ways he felt that Canadians can hack and earn with travel points ways to like travel in a luxurious manner for low cost, not free, low cost. And this includes various ways, whether it's, you know, getting um, business class flights by churning credit cards um, or like, you know, staying in luxurious hotels with similar manners, as well as changing your spending habits, etc. And throughout the podcast, we talk about Ricky's journey of turning a passion project into a full time business and how he transitioned from building the company over a year until he was ready to quit his accounting and finance job at a bank to taking on the path as a full-time entrepreneur. This was honestly a really super fun conversation um, where Ricky shared some basic tactics where a credit card noob like myself could get some actionable steps to start my journey of accumulating huge points the right way um, so that I could eventually schedule my own first luxury travel trip. Um, I read about Ricky's blogs previously and also on the recommendation of my friends as well I just figured I've got to get this guy on the podcast and knowing finding out that he was based out in Toronto and really understanding that his blogs are really focused on helping us Canadians get a lot of luxury travel under our belt I felt it would be just a great opportunity and it definitely did not disappoint and also um, as always Please help the podcast by rating the podcast on iTunes by giving it five stars. This really helps a lot with getting the podcast to rise in the rankings and it really increases increases the outreach and so I can help more young professionals gain a broader perspective for their career journeys and just get more creative with what you can do with your life. So yeah, please leave a a review and a five-star rating on iTunes. I will give you a shout out if you... leave a review I read all of them and so yeah without further ado here is my conversation with Ricky Zhang hey everyone welcome back to another episode of Accounted for today on the podcast I have Ricky Zhang of Prince of Travel hey Ricky Hey, pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. And so to start off, to um, allow our audience to get to know you a little better, um, Prince of Travel, I wanted to introduce it as a travel blog, but I figured you probably have a better description and, um, you know, I guess, sure, title for um, it. So, yeah, can you go ahead and help our audience understand what the company say, does? I would say um, Prince of Travel uh, is, my, is my business. It started off as a blog. Um, and nowadays, I view it as sort of a resource that I'm developing to help Canadians uh, learn to travel the world using their points and miles. Um, I started traveling a while ago by maximizing my credit card reward points, my uh, frequent flyer points, and taking some awesome vacations and trips around the world. And I thought when I started the website, why not help my fellow Canadians do the same using the power of uh, miles and points, and so the the website is basically about teaching people how you can you know earn a lot of points and use them wisely and smartly to um, see more of the world and at a lower cost and sometimes in more luxurious circumstances. Excellent, excellent. No, thanks for that overview. And personally, for me, I've lived in a lot of different countries uh, mm-hmm. I was born in South Korea mm-hmm. lived in Hong Kong for a bit and then I came even when I came to Canada I've lived in Vancouver Toronto Calgary mm-hmm. Waterloo if that can categorize itself as a separate city and <laughs> you know, technically it is and I don't want to offend anyone from no, Waterloo but you know it tends to just fit on the, under the uh, Toronto umbrella but so yeah technically speaking I just lived in like six different cities mm-hmm. and so travel is a very big part of my life it has sure. always been for you, for someone who started a travel blog, 
what was your um you know childhood like growing up did you travel a lot too yeah well i would say that you know we share very similar backgrounds i was born in vancouver actually uh but then we moved when i was a uh, when i was at a very young age we moved back to asia we lived in hong kong for seven years and then i moved to beijing to finish my my high school there and then i came to toronto for for university and while i was in university i went to london as well for an exchange program and so this uh you know this journey of moving around developing a, a holistic world view from different cultures and understanding many cultures many peoples is sort of i think at the core of why i enjoy traveling so much when we were living in asia at a young age uh, you know we went to japan south korea southeast asia so it was pretty easy to get around at the time and you know i think being able to travel at a young age is something i'm very grateful for and there was a point when i was first starting to travel on my own uh once i had come to university and starting to do some trips on my own that i re- realized that you know this is something that i truly love truly enjoy and since then i've been sort of taking as many steps as possible to get to travel more and do it more and that's how uh, how i came to start this website and um you know develop a a lifestyle around travel these days mm. and when when you were young did you have any like what was your dream when you were like 7 years old i don't know to be honest with you like i had many dreams i was a i was a child with many many like fanciful dreams there was a point when i wanted to be a subway train conductor that was my the the very the the highest aspiration of my life for for a time um i was really interested in math and science for a while so i thought you know mathematician sounds cool and then there was a time when i thought oceanography was my true calling you know going study studying the oceans being on a boat um just seeing the 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 great blue oceans out there and so i jumped from place to place and never really had i i would say a true calling until for now this is something that i found is closest to what i love doing the most mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for now i would say yeah no i think um it obviously evolves i think though when i when i looked back i asked myself that question a lot too and i remember when i was young i was obsessed with um animals like specifically snakes <laughs> and the reptiles and i loved like watching the crocodile hunter and i look at car magazines but i look at jeeps mm-hmm. because i was one of, i was thought about doing like wildlife documentary documentaries uh, yeah. and all that just wanted to travel more and all that yeah. um and so for you like you you know you talked about how you wanted to be a mathematician and so you, you went to university in mathematics right you were in yeah. UT and you did mathematics there um and you know if we look at your kind of career journey so far it's it was you went to UT did mathematics you did a exchange in London uh-huh. um then you went to BMO was was there for a little bit and then you went full time to print to travel so how how did that um the mathematician side like you know did it not work out you just realized you don't <laughs> want to do that anymore i think um you know going into university studying math was something that i thought appealed to uh what i was naturally good at um and i i did sort of a a combination major math and economics and you know in the classroom i was looking around me looking at um just the types of people who would go on to become pure mathematicians and i thought you know intellectually that's stimulating but i would kind of drive myself crazy if i were to be looking at proofs and and theorems all day so i thought you know there has to be more out there that's a little more fun to do uh more like invigorating from a a lifestyle perspective and so um naturally as an econ student i was also uh you know a lot of econ students out there view their natural path after university as going to banking or consulting i would say i would say that's really common and i was no exception right uh second year third year i was researching all the investment banking internships all the consulting internships seeing how i could work my way into the industry mostly because i didn't really have any idea of what else i wanted to do besides that so i thought it was a natural fit i thought given my uh skills and academic background it would be something that I'd be pretty good at so I went ahead and and played that game for a while and eventually ended up at Bank of Montreal doing a financial analysis for 2 years of my life now I wouldn't say like I wouldn't say I 
didn't enjoy it there, but I would say that um, having ha having come away from that world now, I'm happy to be in a place where I'm more free to do sort of my own thing. And that's also as a result of having found what my own thing is, uh, being Prince of Travel for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you were at Bank of Montreal, um, what what specifically were you doing? Was it more like a mid-office role or... Yeah, I would say it's it was a finance role, so um, finance and accounting, right? It was uh, in support of the the capital markets division. Mm. Uh, so BMO Capital Markets, uh, you know, investment banking and sales and trading. And I was doing the, yeah, the financial accounting side for that department. Um, and I started out as an intern in in the department and moved on to sort of the analyst role. And uh, it was, yeah, it was two years in total before, before I left. Mm. And so how did this blog form out? Yeah, you said Prince of Travel started out as a travel blog. And so mm. when did you just decide to say, you know what, I'm going to make a blog about this? Yeah, well, it's funny because uh, I think I started actually uh, being engaged in the community of people who travel on points. There's a whole community out there. It's It's fantastic. But I was engaged in this community starting in 2013, 2014, um, and I saw there were other blogs out there, other websites that, you know, I was like, these people have built their lives around this this travel style. It's awesome. Uh, I'd like to do the same one day, but I didn't really, uh, you know, have any action plan around that. Um, it was actually in the beginning of 2016. I was taking a trip, and I was thinking, hey, I could, you know, write about this and write about how this trip was booked and, you know help the people around me do the same, realize their goals, uh, and see the world more. But at the time, I didn't have a domain name for the blog. So I couldn't think of a, a name for the website, and so I kind of let that slide. Until early 2017, that was when I was embroiled in my job in BMO. I think I was, you know, a little bit thinking, uh, what else could I do out there? You know, the world's a big place. What else could I possibly do? And then it was just... Um, randomly one day sitting in a coffee shop that I thought of the name Prince of Travel. Uh, and, you know, my girlfriend was sitting next to me at the time. I was like, what do you think of this name? And she was like, hmm, that works, right? So the next day I registered the domain. I signed up for uh, the Squarespace, the website builder, and the rest is history. That's, uh, that was, yeah, that was February 2017 when it all began. Okay, so, wow, um, you... you it was a, I guess, a spark moment where you just mm -hmm. knew this was this was the right site. Yeah, I think the the way the domain name like came to me, I just thought Prince of Travel, you know, rolls off the tongue. It's memorable. Um, just a a hint of arrogance about it that kind of reflects the the luxury travel that I go on. Uh, I would say sometimes people will go up to me and say like, "What were you thinking when you thought of this domain name?" And I and I can see that point of view too. But hey, it's it's here to stay now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and so then you run the entire site off of Squarespace. Yeah, at the I'm moment? using Squarespace. Uh, it's it's challenging. Um, I don't know. Many listeners might know of Squarespace because they do a lot of marketing. Um, it's a it's a custom website builder, right? They give you templates and they allow you to make a certain degree of changes to the style and look of the website. But the problem is with these templates, a lot of uh, websites kind of look like they all look the same. Right, they look like they're cookie cutter, and you know if if you if you go on a lot of websites and you start to see sort of the same patterns, you'll be able to quickly say, oh, that's a Squarespace website. So my challenge was, uh, after a while, doing the the design for the site to bring it uh, into a more unique realm, right? Using sort of the the coding behind the Squarespace to to make it more to my liking and less like all the other websites out there. Okay, yeah. So for me as well, um, my site uses Squarespace and. Mm -hmm. When I looked at your site, I, my initial thought was, is this a Squarespace site? It looks somewhat <laughs> similar, but then mine has uh, powered by Squarespace at the bottom, and so, mm. but yours didn't. So I was wondering, did he hire a developer to like, build this full website out? It looks somewhat similar, right? Yeah, you can yeah. see a few traces, yeah. but I'd like to think that you know I've got like 600 lines of custom CSS code, which is the, the code that makes it look different, I would say. Mm. And so I, yeah, I spent a lot of time... Uh, I think it was late last year trying to do a full redesign and make sure everything kind of instead of looking like a basic Squarespace website looks like Prince of Travel its own website okay so are you a coder as well you know how to do no, basic no it's, it's well I mean I, I know now I guess but it was really just a matter of uh, teaching myself 
Okay. Right? Lots of Googling. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, you know, along the, along the entrepreneurial journey, that's what, what everything is really lots of Googling and figuring things out. And coding is just one of those. Yeah. Like I, um, it's funny because yesterday I was ta- I was meeting up with my friend who's a front end web developer, mm-hmm. and I was telling him about the frustrations I was having with this, my Squarespace site and mm-hmm. these these elements that I want to make customizable but I can't. It's just yeah. it just doesn't fit with the framework, and it made me really think about, yeah. man, am I am I gonna have to learn coding now so I can start making these changes myself? Yeah, I would say like there's a lot of there were a lot of challenges where, um, where I wanted something to look a certain way using a certain line of code and it just was not doable mm. just no matter what i did it just couldn't be done so then i had to adapt and say okay well i gotta sacrifice this design element of the site and you know design is something that i value right i think people come to the website if it looks nice then they're more likely to return and it sent it sends a certain uh, first impression and also impressions afterwards uh, and so yeah for me that was a challenge coming up with ideas for the design of the site that not only looked good to me, but are also doable within Squarespace. So yeah, for now it's it's with with, uh, with Squarespace, but I'm thinking give it some time and one day I'll just, you know, pay a web developer, like you said, to do a whole a whole revamp and make it just on point. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree. I think Squarespace is kind of the, um, you know, you, you, you pop that website cherry Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and it's an easy way to start for yeah. non-technical people, 100%. And but I think, yeah, um, over time, with the goal of turning you know our sites into company websites, mm-hmm. um, you want to eventually sure. own it and not have to rely on a third party anymore. Yeah. Um, another question I have is, um, is, do you use your email ser- service provider of Google with Gmail? Yeah, I use the the G Suite, right? Yeah, the, the G Suite. Suite. Yeah, so that, yeah. Um, yeah, basically my email Rick at PrinceofTravel dot com is linked to a Gmail uh, okay. front end. Right? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. That's something that's on my task list where I'm just debating which ones I should use and I'm more, I think... What, are you, what are you using at the moment? Right now I'm not using anything. I'm just using my personal Gmail. But oh, I see. since I have the domains, I figured I should get a email yeah. fitting with my site. Um, I was also going to buy a few more domains just separately and yeah. host it on like Bluehost or something. Yeah, um, I would say it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah just, just in case for the future when I want to change names or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so... You know, you talk about how you you thought about having a blog back in like 2013, and it took some time to mm-hmm. eventually push the envelope yeah. and build it out in 2017. Mm-hmm. As you're building out this blog, though, um, did you set out this kind of tipping point ahead of time where you said, you know, what, I want to turn this into a business, um, and after it has a certain mark, I'm going to go full time on it, or was mm-hmm. it a more very organic process where it started out slow and you didn't really think it'd be a business at first, but it showed inklings of potential. Well, there's two questions there, right? Did yeah. I think it was, did I have the mindset of it being a business from the start? Uh, yes, I did. So I, you know, I had studied the idea of blogging before and, you know, there's two camps, right? One of them is it's a hobby. It's something you do for fun. The other is you turn your blog into uh, your life, basically, right? Your Your life's work. And for me, like, I was certainly enjoying the blog more than my day job at the time. And so I, I had the mindset of, you know, if I'm not taking it seriously, then what's the point, right? I'm, I'm here to, I've always, for my whole life, I've been trying to find, like we said before, the one thing that I'm passionate about and that I truly enjoy doing. And here was a, p- a potential candidate, right? This blog that I was having a lot of fun with. So uh, I decided to take it seriously from the very beginning. And that meant committing to a certain schedule in terms of posting. Uh, I do three posts a week at the moment and I've, I have done so since the very beginning. And also just, you know, being alert to emails from readers, having ideas of how to grow the blog and take it in different directions, breaking those ideas down into actionable steps and, and following through on those steps. Uh, in terms of you know adding dimensions to the website and making it look pretty and all the things that go into running an online business, right? Uh, your other question was, um, what was your other question? Um, so whether you kind of had a preemptive um, tipping point, right? Where... The tipping point. Yeah, that's uh, I actually did not like. I didn't really know. Uh, when it would be realistic to focus on Prince of Travel full time. I didn't really have an idea. Well, I mean, it was always about thinking about the income, right? 
obviously it's about seeing whether the income uh, is going to be enough to replace my my day job's income and so it was always about like f- tracking the numbers tracking how much money was coming in but i never really did have like a certain threshold it was more of an emotional moment you know it was towards the end of 2017 early this year uh when i realized this blog is going places um i can take it forwards in a in a way that uh i'm i'm confident that it will pay me dividends in the long run that i will be able to uh build it into something uh build it into a full-time job and if not i'm comfortable with the risks because it's worth it because i've been doing it for so long when i started the blog my my idea was always i'm going to do it for 6 months to a year and see how i like it right because obviously uh even though i thought i would enjoy it a lot there was no guarantee um and after 6 months to a year i realized i'm here to stay i'm truly enjoying this process and you know i'm going to keep doing what i'm doing so once that emotional hurdle was cleared and the income started to build a bit uh build up a bit i realized you know it's time to time to make this move it's the right time mm-hmm. and the during the 6 months when you were posting 3 times a week um mm. how many hours a week were you spending on the blog itself on top of your um you know having a full-time job yeah it was it was basically like having two full-time jobs um cuz it's a lot of work right uh, in terms of writing actually each post i would say nowadays takes me like th- between 3 and 5 hours to finish um i could you know i could potentially spend less time but i i just feel like uh quality over quantity right i i want to make each post worthy of a read for my readers and i want to make them each uh interesting and they'll learn something and they'll hopefully gain a little understanding of my perspective of things as well. So I do put like I would say relatively large amount of time into each blog post. But besides the blog post themselves, most of the work is spent on the on the 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 backbone of the site, right? And I'm talking about stuff like um replying to emails, replying to comments, participating on other, you know, online forums, getting the getting the word out there of Prince of Travel, you know, setting up the the marketing side of things that takes a lot of time as well. So, um, I would say in the first 6 months, I was, you know, not spending that much time because it was still a hobby at the time, but once I realized that this was going to be something I would take forward seriously, I was spending a lot more time. So, I'd be, you know, I'd be at my day job, on my lunch break, I'd be typing posts. Um, go home, finish up the post, publish, do a few other things. Yeah, towards the towards the end I was working pretty much around the clock on both my day job and uh my full-time job. Uh sorry, and Prince of Travel. And nowadays, now that there's no more day job, now that Prince of Travel is my day job, I would say it's the same. Like the the amount of work has just expanded into the amount of time that's available. And I fully I had fully expected that to happen at the beginning because there's so much to do and um you know it's about breaking things into manageable chunks for each day i would say yeah no i totally agree i think um every time i catch up with my friends nowadays i tell them about how i'm working more hours now than i think mm-hmm. i did in any other one of my jobs just yeah. because i tell i i constantly say that it's the real trick is trying to turn off my mind and yeah. trying not to work um yeah. like the weekends are the weekdays like there's no difference really like every day is the same that's exactly it um being an entrepreneur being your own boss is kind of all about that right uh there's a lot of there's this hustle culture in the um, entrepreneurial world and um you know i totally see why it's there but i agree with you that it's important for me to take it a little easier on like fridays and the weekends i i try to do so sometimes if there's a, a big thing i'm trying to implement uh for a certain week sometimes i'll end up spending my saturday and sunday on it that's just the the nature of the the business we're in right yeah yeah i think um like i know this week for sure i um i'm leaving the saturday afternoon completely open mm-hmm. so i can hang out with my girlfriend and her friends yeah. um but and then i told her oh but it's a good thing i'm not seeing you on sunday cuz sunday will be my <laughs> heavy work day um and so you talked about how you know you, 
it was a hobby in the beginning until mm-hmm. you saw the potential of what it could be. Yeah. Was was it one specific moment? Like was it a single blog that just exploded and became viral or um was it continuous small attractions? Like what was it that gave you the sense of confidence that okay, I think it could be something. It, could, it has potential. I think it was yeah, a period of sustained growth, uh both in terms of the number, like the the traffic numbers of people coming to my website and also just uh the response i get from my readers and from the people in the canadian uh, points travel community a period around i would say uh yeah like late last year to early this year when you know it seemed like every new person to the community uh that i spoke to had already heard of my blog through other people or through google right obviously search engine optimization is a huge part of running an online business and you know there there was a point when people i knew personally but whom i hadn't spoken to in a couple of years uh they would message me and they'd say hey i was looking at how to maximize aeroplan and i clicked this website and your your picture was on the side so that was like truly awesome to see for me and i started to feel as though you know i'm developing this online presence where i'm be- i'm beginning to be able to reach people and make a real difference in their lives right um like i said another part of this uh sustained growth was in terms of the the response from readers and i started getting more and more emails saying listen like you helped me book this amazing epic trip that i never would have thought possible right um you know business class to europe asia one week in each place and then off to australia for another week and then back to back to toronto like you know i booked this for my whole family for just uh what 500 in taxes like it was these these emails were almost you know they had a huge impact for me to see that the work i was doing had a real tangible value right people write to me they're they're like i was telling my kids about you and how you helped us book this trip and that just warms my heart so much it's it's my favorite part of writing the blog and when when that started happening i started thinking okay like i've developed this expertise clearly it can benefit a lot of people out there but what's not to love why not go for it right why not give it my everything Mhm yeah and um you know I think you've definitely touched a lot more people than I have but I think for me too like the initial because it's it's not always easy right you're not mm-hmm. always going to get those responses but there are those times when those emails come like when I write a uh, a long essay and someone replies back and says hey man this really changed my perspective yeah. on life or it's helped me make a certain decision um or from a podcast episode a friend tells me yeah you know what I I heard this episode about the guy who went to Africa I'm going to go yeah. to Africa too now like I applied I interviewed and all that then it's like there's meaning behind it and mm-hmm. it's done something yeah. and you see the impact yeah i would say um for the first 6 months or so that was growing uh, like the website was growing very slowly right cuz obviously it starts from zero every new website every new online uh endeavor starts from traffic numbers of zero and for you know i started in february 2017 for February and March pretty much nobody came to the website like 10 people a day if i was lucky i remember a certain date very uh very significant date march 20th 2017 when a grand total of 0 people came to the website like i thought at that point what's the point right what's even the point of me writing three posts a week if nobody's reading them but it's always going to be like that it always takes time to build up an audience um you know soon after march 20th Uh, a friend of mine another blogger sent some traffic to my website he said hey go check out this guy's blog and then that day like 60 people came to the website and i was overjoyed i was over the moon because uh 60 people i've never had that many people come to the website and nowadays obviously 60 isn't such a huge number but i remember yeah throughout the first 6 months uh every time i reached like an all time high in terms of visitors or page views for that day i was just so happy It's always going to be that steady slow growth but eventually you do get to a point if you commit if you you know stick to what you had said in the beginning um and that's why I say uh, I would say for anybody who's trying to start an online endeavor commit to it for 6 months to a year and see how it's working out for you. Yeah, no I think that that's definitely a great advice. Um I think for me um when I launched my blog and everything I had that initial peak in the first month of mm-hmm. like I'd get maybe like a thousand views just in mm-hmm. the month and then it just 
died, yeah. and then it became another slow rebuild back up, and it's still, I don't even know if it's recovered. It continuously yeah. volatility, like, moves up and down. Um, but, yeah, like, it's it's slow. Um, it I've only been, honestly, like, running it for about maybe four months, so uh-huh. much less than you have. Um, but, yeah, like, it's... But just keep at it, I think. Yeah, um, that's something you got to get used to as well. Oftentimes, when you do hit a peak... You'll get that high, and then for the next like two months or so, you'll go down to like fifty percent of that peak, and you'll just be like, "Ah, oh, right, <laughs> what am I doing wrong?" <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you know, you're only four months in, so you're gonna see that like a dozen more times in the in the lifespan of the website. But the important thing is like you gotta even when you're at fifty percent of the peak, you gotta say, um, you know, this is still much better than I was doing say four or five months ago. Right? We're still achieving. Uh, the steady growth and I always what I always do I take my analytics software I always zoom out and look at the overall trend starting from February 2017 and I see this like I said peaks and troughs but an overall trend going upwards and that's what makes me happy at the end of the day Mm -hmm. and so you know you said how like in March you had uh, zero before and then you later Mm -hmm. see like 60 people how many people do you have uh, coming to your site now on like a, a month basis uh, monthly, I would say, so I would say, uh, daily, I would say I get a thousand uniques. Oh, nice. On a daily basis. On a daily basis wow. and about 2000 page views. So that works out to about 30, 35 uniques for the month. And 35,000. 35,000. Yeah. Damn. And 70,000 page views. So it's in that range. When I was starting, um, like, you know, I was starting to read about traffic and how to get traffic and what's considered good traffic. Etc. There's obviously a lot of stuff out there to read and to filter through. Oh, you tell me, man. I'm yeah. I'm going through that right <laughs> now, and it's really tough. <laughs> it's really annoying, but that's that's all part of the, the the journey, I would say. So when I was starting to read all that, um, I had the goal in my mind of 100,000 page views a month, right? That's like a big site. That's gonna make me money. And so I'm slowly inching towards that goal. I can remember in the past year or so growing from yeah like 40,000 to 70,000 as I am now hopefully progressing that onwards uh right now it's October so I'm expecting you know in December it's always down always down because people are on their on their vacations and Christmas New Year's and stuff and I'm always saying to my girlfriend like what could people possibly be doing on Christmas Christmas Eve besides coming to my website right (laughs) like joking around with her but that's the truth I'm expecting you know 70k i'm happy with that for 2018 if i can get maybe 80 for the end of the year that would be awesome and hopefully next year you know push on to the to the realms of being a, a an established website right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and I, I love that how you know you are you know well well past a year and a half you're by next year february you'd probably be hitting the two-year point and mm-hmm. after two years you know then you'd maybe even consider yourself being an established website mm-hmm. even after um you know, having like 70,000 people come yeah, to that's the goal. your site months. Yeah. And yeah, it take, um, and I think, you know, it, it could even take longer for some people, right? Mm-hmm. It might take longer than two years. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it might be faster. And I think that's the thing we just can't predict how things will happen. Yeah. Um, and for you then, how, how soon or when did you start really like generating revenue off the site where now it became kind of more like a business mm-hmm. where now you're actually generating income? Yeah, I would say, um, so my website talks about travel using points, and uh, a large component of that is earning those points by signing up for like credit cards with big bonuses. Um, people often ask me, what's the best credit card out there? And they're wondering, like, how can I get the best return on my spending, right? Whereas the angle that we have over at Prince of Travel is you got to keep signing up for cards, keep getting those bonuses and uh, use those bonuses to travel. And so when I talk about cards, when I uh, encourage people to sign up for the credit cards to get the bonuses, there's these referral links, which I have, right? People sign up for the links, um, and I get a certain kickback. And so that is uh, one of the main components of how the website is monetized. Uh, And that started, I would say, April 2017. Like, soon after I started, there were people using my links, and I was like great like people must be valuing the knowledge that i'm putting out there but it didn't get to sort of a sustainable rate until like i said it was like november no actually it was yeah it was january 2018 when i was like oh my god like so many people are using my links that if this uh sustains throughout the year 
it's good money, right? Uh, and I, I did the math for January and then February, and you know things were going swimmingly. And then it, it's funny because these things are obviously uh, not completely within your control because in March, uh, American Express, which runs the, which operates these credit cards that have the huge bonuses, changed some of their rules, making the referrals a little less lucrative. Uh, and that was obviously a big blow to me because that reduced like the amount of income I could potentially earn by a, a big percentage. But by that time, I had already committed to the idea of running this full time. And I had faith in myself that, yeah, like there's going to be other ways to monetize. There's, you know, as, as long as traffic grows, it'll be monetizable, right? So, um, yeah, I would say early this year is when it started to happen in terms of the income. And nowadays it's about bringing together multiple income sources. Sure, there's the credit card referrals, there's the advertisements on the site, but also potentially looking into, you know, launching consulting services, uh, booking services for people who are interested in using their points but don't really have the time to figure all this stuff out. Right? That's one of the angles that I'm hoping to move in uh, in, the near, in the near future. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And in, so if we were to look at your business itself as um, how the income is generated, mm-hmm. um, how would it really be split um, like percentage-wise between like affiliate, so like credit card referrals from like mm-hmm. an affiliate form of income and like advertising revenue on the site? Yeah, I would say uh, probably like 75, 25. Advertisements are not the most lucrative way uh, for now, like in my experience. I used to use Google AdSense, which is like the the introductory advertising service that everybody uses, and they don't pay well at all. Like they paid me like $100 a month. For 70,000 page views? For, yeah, for at the time it was like 50,000. But yeah, it was nothing. Like I can't, you know, I can't feed myself with that. And then after you get to a certain point, there's like these advertising networks that you can join. So they have like a stronger pull among uh, potential advertisers. And they also pay you out a lot better in terms of the actual income you earn on a monthly basis. Uh, I joined Mediavine, it's called, in August. And, you know, I I get nowadays I get like seven or eight times as much as I get from Google AdSense, which really helps to... Uh, uh, build up that part of the income stream, right? It's good, like, passive money in the sense that as long as I keep posting consistently, people keep coming to the website, there's going to be ad money flowing in. What I would um, say about, yeah, I would say 25% ads, 75% 75%, uh, the credit card referrals, and also, you know, credit card referrals sometimes pay me in points, and then the points I can use towards funding my travels as well. Right, right. Yeah, and I'm, I'm taking down notes for even my, my own site growth. Um, would you, in terms of like gen- signing up for these like media vines or like mm-hmm. these advertising networks, would you recommend like for myself, like future vloggers, mm-hmm. um, to only go after you've hit a certain point of like unique visitors or page views? Which yeah, they, to be they do have it? a threshold. Mm. Uh, and that's how they um, maintain their pull for advertisers, right? They say to advertisers, look, we have... Uh, a suite of premium online businesses who are looking for advertisers and they all have a certain level of traffic before they're allowed to join. So Mediavine, I think, is 25,000 sessions per month. If you get to, I would say, 20,000 uniques, you should be getting to 25,000 sessions. So it's it's not, you know, it should be achievable within like six months to a year, um, given uh, a consistent posting schedule, like I said. And you know, the usual SEO stuff. Um, But yeah, like, there's definitely a reason they have that threshold, and that's to be able to pay out these these big, bigger payouts compared to Google AdSense, right? Google AdSense is sort of just what everybody gets started with. There's always um, bigger and better things out there, and Mediavine is just one example. I also, um, you know, I'm aware from having researched this that the, the, the biggest payouts are often when you sell advertising to an advertiser directly, right? There's a company that wants to advertise on your website. You say you give them, uh, say, three months of ad, ad space and uh, three months of ads on your newsletter or something, and they cut you a certain ch- chunk of money. And usually that pays better than going with the agencies as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think right now, um, as I'm looking for advertising aven- avenues for podcasts as well, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, trying to build out the strategy of 
yeah. you know, how should I get the advertisers on? How do I approach them directly? Who should I approach and all mm-hmm. that? And so that's the big problem that I'm trying to strategize and solve. Um, in terms of like the kind of content marketing you do then, you said you you know spend a lot of time, you know, answering blogs, going mm-hmm. out to forums, you know, doing this things that are not scalable right now in order to scale later on. Yeah. Um, what what kind of content marketing strategy have you found is the most effective? Um, yeah, I would say like building, doing everything you can to establish yourself as an authority and preferably the authority on your topic, right? Uh, like I would say I've built this knowledge throughout years of experience and I do my best to convey that through the website itself. But if people aren't coming to the website, they're not they're not getting to see that, right? So it's all about going on, like the reason I go on to the Reddit forums and the Facebook groups to participate and share my knowledge is so people see, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about. Maybe I should go to his site and read up on what he's up to, what else he has to say, et cetera. Yeah, it's what I've found in my experience to be the biggest like spikes of traffic that get sent to my website every now and then is when you know, I've demonstrated that, you know, I, I've built up all this knowledge and here's why you should listen. Here are the things that I've written on my blog post that will benefit you hugely if you were to put them into practice. Come have a look. Uh, and some of my most popular blog posts are also following that, that train of thought, right? Uh, stuff that other people out there either don't know or haven't talked about, if, if you put it out there, uh, you get people coming in and absorbing that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that's that's a strategy I'm looking into as well, where I just reach out to people like directly on LinkedIn or uh-huh. even just adding value to the community, like answering questions on Quora or like Reddit. Is that what you do? Like you just go to a Reddit forum and just a question someone has about travel. Someone says, "I have questions on aeroplane points. You know, mm-hmm. what's the best way?" And you just go and just put out a long answer that yeah well the easy the easy part for me is there's already a whole reddit community dedicated to this stuff which i was part of before starting the website as well Mm. right and so yeah like people ask questions in there on a daily basis and i do my best to answer them whenever possible you know and i've got like in my flare on reddit you can have like a little a little message right by your username i basically said you know I'm helping you answer this question right now, but there's more on my website if you want to learn more. And at the beginning, I did a lot of that work myself. Um, you know, if there's a if there's someone someone has a question, and I think that my blog post would be helpful, I'd put the link in there, and I'd be like, "Come read this." And then, you know, as the website starts to grow, I realized that other people were doing it for me. That's that's sort of another marker of when I realized that I was becoming this authority, when I realized I was becoming a respected figure in this community, it was when people, uh, you know, newcomers to this community had questions and other people who also read my blog and who also uh, knew of the value that I provide would just link to my article on behalf of me and then I just upvote it. (laughs) Nice. Yeah, so at that point, you know, I, I don't have to go in and promote my own links anymore. Um, it's just a matter of writing stuff that the communities out there will find helpful and then sort of depending on my my audience who do want to spread the word uh, to go out there and share it with others. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's an amazing form of validation you're getting from the market where mm-hmm. it's really kind of proving your position out and it also shows that all the things you did, all the hustle you had mm-hmm. of answering questions constantly, it's slowly paying off um, bit by bit. And so, you know, you talked about how you started generating <clears throat> revenue mm-hmm. early this year, mm-hmm. and that's also similar to the time frame where you've decided to go full time into Prince of Travel. Yeah. And so, when you were making that decision, um, what was the decision process like for you mentally? Um, and how did the second part is how did your surrounding kind of family and friends <laughs> respond to it? So I think those two questions uh, have very different answers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I assume so. Uh-huh. For me, like at that point at BMO, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty eager to find something else to do. Like, not gonna lie, um, I have a lot of respect for my boss and coworkers, uh, but you know, it was one year and a half into a job that I thought I was pretty good at, but didn't necessarily feel passionate about or. Uh, necessarily enjoy on a day-to-day basis whereas I was enjoying 
Prince of Travel, right? I was loving it. I was, you know, like you said, there's a feeling of validation. Um, people, if people would tell me that my work has changed their lives in some way, that's, you know, it really can't be underestimated how powerful that is in terms of making yourself feel like it, what the work you're doing is worthwhile. So I was really enjoying that part of my life, wasn't quite enjoying my day job. And so for me, once I realized that the income was going to come in, it was a no-brainer. Um, the only concern that I would have to think about, as you touched upon, is you know, how are the people around me going to react? So when I first brought up the idea with my girlfriend, for example, I first floated the idea like before this moment of realization came around. It was like mid-2017, and she basically shot me down. She said, it's unrealistic, you know, don't make any rash decisions yet. Um, keep at it and see what happens. And she was right, obviously. Uh, that was the wise move at the time. And once, you know, once early this year came around and I, and I told her, yeah, I think by the middle of the year I'm going to leave the job and focus on this full time, she had her hesitations, right, because she wasn't sure that the on the money side of things that things would work out perfectly. But at the end of the day, like, I was set on it, and I'm pretty headstrong on things that I'm set on. So, like, the, the decision was made once it clicked in my head. And the rest of the the rest of the the time spent talking about the decision was with my girlfriend and my parents. Who uh, it was interesting because I came back to went back to Beijing for Chinese New Year to see them. My mom was like very supportive, and she's always been the kind of person who'd be like, you know, as long as you thought it through, um, as long as you know you're going to enjoy it and that you're going to be able to. Uh, one, you're confident you'll be able to uh, make it work in terms of money. And two, you're comfortable with the risk that it might not work. As long as you thought it all through, then she's on board. So she was, uh, you know, no problem, super easy to convince. My dad, on the other hand, just spent like a whole week trying to say like, R Ricky, it's, it's a better idea if you stay, stay at the bank for a bit, stay at your stable job. Um, and maybe consider doing this next year. And he would frame it in all sorts of different angles, right, to try to get me to see uh, from his perspective. And obviously that's understandable as parents. It's, um, they feel risk averse when, they're, when their kids are doing stuff like this. Uh, but for me, like I, like I said, the decision had already been made, and I just told my dad, look, I'm not going to ask you for money. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all going to be fine, and I have faith in myself, in my own abilities to make it happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And w at that time, when you had taken the leap now to full time, a mm -hmm. um, full time entrepreneurship, did was the income of Prince of Travel enough to sustain the current lifestyle you were living, or were you still kind of dipping into your savings a little bit? Yeah, I would say at the time it was sort of approaching that level, but not quite. So I did. Uh, tell my girlfriend, for example, hey, we're going to have to like eat out less and <laughs> you know, adjust our lifestyle a little bit. Thankfully, that hasn't actually happened. Like, it's, been, it's been pretty good so far. Obviously, the thing about online entrepreneurship is you never know. Uh, like, things can change from week to week, right, in terms of how much. So, like, take Mediavine, for example. They just, for some reason, advertisers pay less in October than they do in September. That's just how it works. Like, I, I'm not really sure, and I haven't really spent much time uh, delving into why that is. But like I said, there can be fluctuations in terms of the income you get, so it's not just a biweekly paycheck that you can always count on. Uh, and you have to be comfortable with that, right? You have to be comfortable in that little bit of uncertainty. You have to, yeah, you have to be comfortable living with that uncertainty while you're doing your best out there to maximize all your your revenue streams. And... Yeah, I would say it's been four or five months so far of delving into the world of entrepreneurship. I have no regrets. It's been good. Yeah, and yeah. are you are you close to um, meeting the income levels of how, which you're making at BMO? No. Yeah, I would say I'm about the same. Okay, wow, yeah. wow. Which makes me very happy. Like, yeah, it's, it honestly, uh, I'm very grateful to have, obviously, like to have had this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, and I pinch myself, right? It's 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 pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I, my job is to travel the world and tell people what I think of things and teach them how to do the same. Mm -hmm. What could be better? And obviously, you know, this is this is just like the end result after you know close to like two years worth of hard work that you've actually been putting in and 
previous years of travel you've been constantly doing and accumulating knowledge of. Yeah. And, you know, obviously I'd be remiss if I didn't get some, you know, travel advice from you while I have you here as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so first question is, um, what credit card are you using right now? Well, uh, see, you know, a lot of a lot of people ask me that question. Yeah, I bet. And, th- you know, there's an answer. I'm using the American Express Business Platinum or the American Express Gold Rewards Card uh, or the American Express Cobalt, depending on what I'm spending. So that is one part of the game where if you don't want to take things so seriously and apply for like 10 credit cards and get the sign-up bonuses and earn points that way, then one of the best ways you can earn points is to figure out which cards give you the best returns on which category of spending and use those cards for whatever you're purchasing, right? So the Cobalt, for example, is amazing because it gives you five times the points on food and drinks. You know, we're millennials, we're these young professional types, and, uh, you know, we go out to eat a lot. We go out to drink a lot. And so having the Cobalt lets you earn points on, on that uh, that portion of your spending at a very, very rapid pace. Then you take, for example, the business platinum, which is, which gives you a general good return on everyday spending. 1.25 points, uh, membership rewards points, it's called, the American Express membership rewards, 1.25 per dollar. And then you can transfer those points onto Aeroplan or the British Airways Avios program and use them uh, if you know the you know the sweet spots where they give you the best value, use them towards those redemptions and get yourself some pretty amazing trips. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the basic strategy. Find out which cards work best for your situation, and adopt that strategy and go and use it on your everyday spending. Like I have those two American Express cards, but a lot of places don't take American Express, so I need a good Visa as a backup. That's another another part of it. Right. And so, what's your backup Visa? Uh, right now, it's the CIBC Aeroplan, but it could change. Like like I said, my strategy, uh, in addition to using the right cards, would also be to sign up for cards and cancel, right? Right. Uh, on a continual basis. So, you know, in a couple of months, I'm going to need to cancel that CIBC Aeroplan visa and get another one for my backup visa. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, um, I I dabbled in that kind of stuff. I read, mm-hmm. I, I I love the whole gamification of points mm-hmm. and trying to get this travel as, as well. I've, I obviously haven't been quite successful as you. Um, also, I think it requires a lot of time to mm-hmm. really invest in and really be serious about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've, you know, gotten like the welcome bonus at the TD aeroplane before yeah. and then yeah. used like the gold American Express. But those were a couple of years ago. And so I think now some of them have probably reset after reading your blog on, you know, time limitations, some have mm-hmm. a limit, some don't, it yeah. seems. And so I think I've probably reset on all of them. So if I were to start off again now, mm-hmm. um, how how do you think I should start off? There's a really good offers right now on the Business Platinum. Uh, there's a special offer from Canada Post. It's like, it's like a partnership offer that American Express did with Canada Post Small Business Services. And yeah, it gets you a lot of points and it has... Uh, a $400 annual fee, but the amount of points you get far outweighs that. Um, and then starting from there, you sort of look at the other cards and cycle them. Pretty much the most uh, most common practice, I would say, among people who do uh, who do practice the, they call it churning, right? Churning credit cards, so opening, closing, getting the bonus every time. Yeah, it's basically identifying the best offers out there and getting like two to three cards every three months. So I'm sure a lot of re- uh, listeners are like, won't that ruin your credit score, right? So it's a question I get all the time. But the truth is it won't because if you understand the way your credit score works, every new card you get decreases your score by a little bit. But every new card that you can demonstrate, you can use responsibly, increases your score by more. Mm. So if you keep getting credit cards and using them responsibly, right, paying off the balance every month, not carrying interest, not having late fees, then your credit score is likely to stay the same or perhaps even increase because you're demonstrating that you can use so much credit so responsibly. Anyway, yeah, so the plan would be start out with a business platinum is what I would say. Um, and then there's there's a whole bunch of offers right now. There's the American Express Business Gold as well. It's, uh, I think, 40,000 points for no fee from Canada Post. Uh, American Express, by the way, has by far the 
the biggest chunk of these great offers out there. So if you do want to get into the game, then they're by far the first uh, the first issuer you should look at. If you look at the big five banks, their offers tend to be a little softer, but there's still a few good ones that you can you can consider. Um, right now, CIBC has some pretty good offerings. Right now, they've they're really going in hard on their credit cards for uh, for Q4 of, of 2018. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think um, on your site when I was look, looking through it, it seemed the CIBC cards had the best kind of option where if you're for like non Amex based um, cards that offer a lot of good aeroplan points. Mm-hmm. It seems to be CIBC had a lot of good ones there. Yeah, and also less restrictive on re-signing up within the year and stuff. Yeah, um, most. You know, the, that's the thing about this this practice of opening closing credit cards. It's kind of, I would say, something that the banks haven't taken such a close look at because not many people do it uh, compared to the total number of credit card clients. Like if you look at American Express and CIBC, they have in their terms and conditions, they say that if you do uh, apply for it, if you have held the card before, you won't be eligible for another sign-up bonus, but they don't enforce those. So, you know, it's kind of in that gray area uh, right now where I think the banks are starting to pay attention to this stuff a little bit, but still not to the extent that they're actually going to do something about it. So the opportunities out there are still ripe if you want to, I don't know, um, travel the world uh, like like a boss. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, get in before you, your site grows too big. <laughs> There's too many people <laughs> breaking the system. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, and so for Amex, for example, like I use the Amex Cobalt. And I use it for everyday uh-huh. spending because it's all like food and meals. That's what I use my yeah, spending for. Sure. for. Um, is is there no limit in terms of me getting an Amex Gold and a Platinum at the same time? No. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. They, they want you to get cards. Okay, yeah. I think about it from the, the issuer's perspective. The more outstanding uh, credit limits you have, yeah, the yeah. likelier you are to default on it and pay them pay them a shit ton in, in fees and interest so if you think about it that way yeah it's in it's in both of the issuers and your best interest to actually get these cards obviously you are going to be doing your best to be not profitable for them right you're going to be doing it responsibly and getting the points and using them wisely but at the time of application they absolutely want you to sign up for all these cards mm-hmm. and you know you you tend to go on a lot of these trips mm-hmm full business class yeah. and if do you tend to use like aeroplan for yeah absolutely most of the times um right now i would say aeroplan is like the best uh program for canadians who do want to first of all travel the world a lot to a lot of different places because aeroplan partners with the star alliance uh through air canada basically you can travel anywhere in the world using those points um and then the good thing about Aeroplan is their the chart, the redemption chart allows you to, you know, book business class and first class for reasonable number of points compared to how much those flights would cost if you were to book them with cash. Right? If I had to fund my travels with money that like, you know, that I earn from from my my income, then there's no way I would travel in business class, right? Cuz it'd be like $5,000 for a round trip. You know, I can't afford that, but um, if you use points, the the cost in terms of points is often only like 1.5 to two times the cost of an economy trip, and given that you can earn so many points so easily, it makes sense to splurge on mm-hmm. business class and treat yourself to these honestly pretty life changing experiences around the world. Yeah, and in terms of um, I guess booking a business class trip, I think on average going to Europe or like Asia is going to be on like you got to go past like the hundred thousand. Point mark, and mm-hmm. so that will probably be around like three different credit card book and bonuses, yeah, right? Two to three. Yeah, I would yeah, say. yeah. If you focus on the larger American Express ones, you can make it happen with two. Two. Yeah. Is that the platinum and the gold? That's the business platinum. Yeah. And yeah. Then the, either the either the business platinum with the personal platinum. Yeah, yeah. Or the business platinum and the business gold. Also, you can you can get personal platinum and business oh, platinum get, separately. Oh wow! Like, listen, you can get all the cards at once. <laughs> that's wow. just how the game is played. Yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. that's amazing. Um, okay, so then you get all that, and there's also like the tax component. And I think you might have also listed about how certain airlines charge lower ta- taxes and like mm-hmm. surcharge fees for mm-hmm. using airplanes. Is that what you also focus on as well? Yeah, that's that's the key, right? People, um, I often go on CBC and see people denouncing the aeroplan program, saying that it's 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 always like an elderly person living in like Halifax or something, and they'd say like, oh, I've been saving on my aeroplan miles for 15 years to book business class to Europe. 
And when I tried to use them, it tried to charge me like $1,000 in fees. And then they would go to CBC and complain. And whenever I see an article like this, I'm always motivated to sort of defend Aeroplan because you can use Aeroplan for some pretty crazy trips and pay only like $200 in fees if you know what you're doing, right? So the biggest part of that is dispelling this notion that you have to use Aeroplan miles on Air Canada flights because the Air Canada flights will charge you a huge amount in fees, $500, $1,000. But like I said, there's 28 Star Alliance partners out there that can get you to all corners of the world. And if you were to use your miles on, on those airlines, many of which have an even better business class than Air Canada, uh, just just as a bonus, if you were to use your miles on, on those airlines, you'd pay, yeah, $200 to go to Asia, back and forth in business class. And then one of the great things of, about the program is you can have stopovers. So instead of just doing a round trip, you can go to Australia for a week, go to Asia for a week, uh, go to Africa for a week, and just pay the same amount of miles as you would have paid for a round trip to Australia. That's pretty magical, right? That's like three trips in one. And by truly maximizing every aspect of the program, so you do your stopovers, you, do your, uh, you choose your airlines that don't have surcharges, you're getting excellent value from your points. Um, and that's kind of the crux of how the game is played, right? You, you earn the points for as little money as possible, and then you redeem them for as high value as possible. And you, in the, mean, in the meanwhile, you capture that value in between. And I'm, and I'm guessing um, you also, whatever fee you got to pay with the um, the taxes and all that, you use like the cobalt card to yeah. cut. <laughs> you got to pay for every expense. You got to consider what, what's best. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think because I think the cobalt um, American Express, they have the membership select points, which I can't convert to Aeroplan. Mm-hmm. So it's sometimes better off to just use them to just cancel credit out the um, costs I use for like hotels and Airbnb yeah, yeah. and all if that. If you have membership rewards select, so... So yeah, so membership rewards, the normal kind, you mm-hmm. can convert to the freaking flyer programs. The cobalt points, uh, you can only convert to the hotel program. Mm. So Marriott is the big one right now. Uh, pretty much the only hotel program in Canada that's actually can deliver spectacular value to you. But you can convert your cobalt points to Marriott and, for example, stay at the Ritz-Carlton um, for free. Mm. It's pretty awesome, right? And so do you also turn... Um, points for the hotels as well yeah so so obviously hotels matter as well everybody has different travel styles you know some prefer airbnbs uh, which i totally get as well um but for me yeah the hotel cards are out there and so i did collect a whole bunch of points um in those programs and nowadays i pretty much exclusively stay at the marriott properties because number one you know i can use my points for free stays number two I've stayed there so many times that they treat me like there's that elite status, right? They, you stay at it more, you get better treatment. So I always get like, yeah, room upgrades, free breakfast, all that good stuff. Wow. So even if you use points, you still get the status mm-hmm. upgrades too? Yeah, you do. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, if you put all of this together, you can envision building a lifestyle in which uh, the way you travel has completely changed, right? Yeah. From something that's resembling like sitting in the back of economy, staying at hostels, which is how I used to travel before any of this. Um, and I have fond memories of doing that as well. But yeah, changing from, from that to business class, first class, getting off the plane, getting into your, 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 your hotel chauffeur's car, and then being driven to your St. Regis or Ritz-Carlton. And um, it's something I'm very grateful for, and I'm hoping to enjoy here while while these opportunities are available. And I think that's the correct mindset to take that, you know, who knows, who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? Maybe they're going to cut down on the ability to, to earn these points so cheaply. But for now, these opportunities are here to be maximized. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. And so you're getting these status with um, hotels and stuff, but do you also get st- status with airlines um, while using the points? That's different. So on airlines, if you redeem a flight with points, you don't earn any status miles. Mm. So the, the, the flip side to that is if you're redeeming points for business class, you're already getting everything that the airline status gives you, right? You're, oh, getting, yes. you're getting your lounge access. You don't need upgrades because, because you're already in business class. <laughs> <laughs> so before, yeah, before I started flying business class, I would be concerned with the airline status and how I could maximize these benefits. But once I have gotten into the habit um, of earning lots of points and using them for business class, 
that's that part of the game sort of doesn't matter to me anymore mm-hmm. and i think mm-hmm. i think a big hurdle that i was trying to overcome mentally was just the idea of like for example like the amex cards they have hefty annual fees but mm-hmm. understanding that you're paying these fees but for value like it's not free mm-hmm. yeah but it's actually getting value out of it yeah there's no such thing as free travel right even even if you stay at a hotel uh and you, when you stay at a hotel using points you don't need to pay any fees but you know those points have value in themselves right there's a whole gray market on which these points are bought and sold so there's clearly some value to every point you earn so i would say there's never any such thing as free travel and it's not about free travel it's about taking your existing travel budget and stretching it to be 5 or 10 times the quality or quantity of travel as you have without points. So say somebody has an annual travel budget of 5000, right? Might be enough for like a 2 week trip to Europe uh without points. But if you can use points to cover your uh flights and hotels, which is like 80% of your expenditures, then $5000 like last year, 2017, I spent $5000 on travel for two people. Two people, five thousand dollars. But I went to Saint Kitts for five days. I went to Seattle for a weekend. Uh, I went to. I did around the world to Europe and China for two weeks, business class, right? Wow. I went to London uh, for a week, and then in the New Year's I went to Bali. That's the whole idea, right? You take your $5, existing tra- five thousand uh, dollars out of pocket. And and that is um, including flights and. Yeah, um, resort inclusive of flights, resorts, annual fees. Wow. Uh, you know, ferries that you have to take, trains and stuff. That's the whole idea. You 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 can't really think of it as lowering your spending, but rather unlocking these special experiences out there that you would never otherwise get to experience. Right, right, right. Wow. Okay. So, you know, I'm planning on going on a trip to Southeast Asia mm-hmm. um in the next month or so. I don't think I have enough points right now or I might not have you know spending happening mm-hmm. in the next month to mm-hmm. get all the reward points but in terms of even booking trips like i was planning on going from toronto to vancouver mm-hmm. stay there see some folks and then going to seoul to uh, stop over going to chiang mai hanoi and mm-hmm. then coming back um is there a smart way of going about doing this yeah so um it's all about learning the intricacies of each program uh and maximizing what they allow you to do, right? So in your example, Vancouver, you want to stop there for a certain period. Seoul, you want to stop for a certain period and you said Chiang Mai and Hanoi. Hanoi, okay. So that's like four places. So let's take Aeroplan for an example, right? Aeroplan lets you stop in three places. You have a destination and you have two stopovers along the way. And so in total that's three places where you can stop for over 24 hours. Okay? Uh so if I were to give you some advice I would say you know you could use your stopovers in Vancouver and Seoul and then make your destination like Chiang Mai and then between Chiang Mai and Hanoi you can just book uh a cheap ticket on like Thai Lion or something right because you got to know where in the world there's availability for uh for like low cost carriers if you're going to Europe that's the same thing if you're flying between two neighboring countries that are not that far apart you can obvi- uh often get a ticket for Thirty dollars or forty dollars. So yeah, I would advise if you have, um, are you looking travel business or economy? I guess um, I'll have to do economy now because okay. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have enough points. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I mean, it's still going to be an unforgettable trip, right? Mm. That's. It's not just about the journey, right? It's yeah, ultimately yeah. still about the destination. Economy to um, Southeast Asia. That's what ninety thousand, aeroplane points. Probably yeah. Yeah, ninety thousand. Um, that'll get you a stopover in Vancouver, stopover in Seoul. uh t- destination is Chiang Mai and then just add on like $30 in a cheap flight to to Vietnam and you're all good and you'll probably pay if you if you do what I said right and avoid Air Canada avoid the 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 airlines with huge surcharges you'll probably pay $250 to $300 all in yeah damn i can i really wish i went you sooner <laughs> so i could have started accumulating points so i can actually travel that way i mean listen we all wish we had started doing this sooner right? yeah, yeah as long yeah. as you're as long as you're keen about travel as long as you like going out there seeing the world yeah. then i can't really think of any situation oh you have to be financially responsible right honestly right. that's really important to say um i i do apologize for not mentioning it earlier but you know you can't go out there and play the credit cards game if you would be tempted to overspend 
spend beyond your means and carry credit card debt because then any interest you pay and the ruining of your credit card score, sorry, credit score, would completely defeat the purpose of earning these points, right? So that's obviously a huge prerequisite, but uh, I assume your financials are <laughs> uh, perfectly in order. And so, yeah, then as long as you're interested in seeing the world, then I can't think of a situation in which it wouldn't benefit you to get started. Yeah, no, um, I'm definitely going to be looking at more credit cards to potentially start churning that and start accumulating mm-hmm. the points of hotels and flights mm-hmm. as well. I think it's kind of a lost cause right now for my next trip. I'll probably have to pay the full yeah. economy I mean, price, but yeah. um, no, I'll definitely keep that into consideration though for the future. Um, and, you know, we're kind of hitting the final runway marks of the uh-huh. interview. Um, I also want to be conscious of the value of your time as well. And so right now, you know, you've traveled a lot. You've been to so many different cities. Yeah. Um, how many cities have you gone to? Cities? I, I don't really count. Okay. <laughs> I you... spend my time counting the cities here. Then how about but uh, I would countries? say, yeah, 39 countries. Oof. And my goal, obviously, my dream is to visit all 193. Nice. And, um, you know, using points will be an essential Yeah, hopefully all business class, there. right? <laughs> hopefully, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so is, has there been a particular place that... Um, you felt like, man, I, I actually really want to live here. Like, this is a really cool place I never like, expected it to be like. Yeah, um, I kind of have that feeling wherever I go. Okay. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I, yeah. I like to think of myself as very adaptable and uh, keen to absorb as much as possible. And so, you know, I was in um, Brazil twice, and I really enjoyed it there. I thought hmm. the people have a really good... Uh, passion for life and they take it easy you know nobody really takes themselves too seriously and I thought it'd be cool to like like, it'd be awesome to spend six months in South America just hanging out um, maybe doing a few like you know I could run the blog from anywhere in the world right right so it'd be great to just you know absorb fully immerse myself in a different culture different language um, meet some people from different walks of life and just expand my horizons that way another part of the world i love is just asia right i spent my life growing up there um you know i'm not just gonna move away and never go back i look at any city in asia these days and i think you know things are happening things are moving really quickly and it's really exciting and i'd love to be back there for some for some period of time Hmm. in the future as well have you ever considered uh moving away long term to a different place? Well, I would say um, it's interesting because when I first came to Toronto and for the first like four or five years I was here, you know, I didn't feel that much of a connection to the city. I didn't feel like it was the place for me. Not that I didn't like anything about it. There was just not that connection. But ever since starting Prince of Travel, Prince of Travel is very Canadian. Right? It's very much tethered me to the Toronto community, uh, you know, I've met so many great people who are passionate about the same things I am. Um, you know, that ranges from other people who are interested in uh, traveling the world on points to the huge uh, entrepreneur community here. Right? It's it's absolutely fantastic, and it's a great resource. And so for now, I think Toronto is like where I'm based, and I think it makes sense to stay here, uh, given the work I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But who knows what the future holds? Right? That's that's always my position. Yeah, and. You know, it, given that big uncertainty, what kind of a vision do you have for the Prince of, Prince of Travel for like the next five years? I think the blog will always be there. Um, I think, you know, first of all, it's something I really enjoy doing. Sharing what I'm up to, my travels, my perspectives with the readers is a key part of why I do what I do, and that's not going to stop. But I do think, besides the blog itself, it's uh, there's a whole lot of potential for other resources and services that Prince of Travel could provide, right? Right now, I'd like to think of the website as, you know, one of the biggest voices in the Canadian uh, points community. And on that platform, there's a lot of ways that the website can help people who, like I said, people who might not have the time to delve into all this, right? There's services that I can provide. There's, um, yeah, there's value that I can add in that regard. So I'm hoping to flesh out those ideas a little more in the near future and and implement them and eventually make it you know something that can sustain itself in yeah. the long run. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. <clears throat> I I definitely would love to have you back on 
in the near yeah, future. Absolutely. Um, hopefully after I've taken more of your advice and <laughs> implemented some points yeah. that I can get more uh, tactical strategies from there on. Um, yeah. And so, you know, before we do kind of the closing, um, where can people reach you? Like, what's your site? Um, how can they support you? Oh, absolutely. Um, so princeoftravel.com is the website. It's a pretty, uh, pretty obvious uh, contact form in the top right-hand corner if you do want to get in touch. You can also email me. It's rick, R-I-C-K, at princeoftravel.com. Um, I'm very nice. <laughs> I like to think of myself. I try to respond to every email. And, you know, in the past, there was a... Uh, I could use the excuse that I just missed the email. But these days, like, the recent Gmail update, they, they remind you. Yes, they <laughs> You've do. You've noticed that, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. And so I'm like, oh, shit, there's no excuse anymore for me yeah. to miss any emails. So, yeah, if you write me, I'll probably write back. And, yeah, I'd love to... You know, I love connecting with readers and helping them out, and getting whether that's getting started or progressing further along the learning curve. Um, so yeah, I'm ha- I'm happy to to receive questions from anyone. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll definitely be supporting you by clicking on your affiliate links and <laughs> when I sign up for new credit cards. And you know, listeners, you should do the same as well. Um, yeah, Rick, thanks for thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I had a lot of fun yeah, on our this conversation. Was, this was awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, have a good one. Cheers. So thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please check out other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date for the future episodes. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, whichever is applicable to you. To see past episodes, you can go to oldmandan.com slash podcasts. Also, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter on my blog, oldmandan.com slash newsletter. You can stay up to date with future podcast episodes that way and included in the newsletter are my book reviews I write, my weekly article in the related to the domain of self-development systems, as well as seven things I learned throughout the week on being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Finally, special thanks to icons8.com for allowing me to use their music, Tiny People, on the podcast. Great. I will see you all next time. Take care.